Well, this is the Cooperative Baptist Fellowships Conversations. Each week we bring you stories of our fellowship through interviews with people doing groundbreaking work and renewing God's world. Ideas, stories, and innovation from ministers, authors, and practitioners from across the fellowship and beyond. I'm your podcast host, Andy Hale, and this week we have a special Facebook and YouTube live interview talking about uh, taking a stand against Christian nationalism. In a few moments, I'll introduce our guest and we'll jump into our conversation. But we do want to let you know that you have the opportunity to present questions to our guest. If you want to comment to the right, if you're on Facebook or uh, with your questions uh, on YouTube down below, we need to tell you about one of our annual sponsors, which is the Center for Congregational Health. At the center, we help lay leaders, clergy, and congregations find ways to thrive in the midst of change. Our experience in highly trained consultants and coaches don't prescribe one-size-fits-all solutions. Instead, we work alongside you and take your unique congregation ministry context serious. We believe the wisdom for thriving comes from the leadership of the Spirit, and we help create spaces for congregations to hear and to recognize that God-given wisdom. Please visit our website, healthychurch.org, to learn more about the center and to find the help you need in order to thrive in ministry. Well, our guest for this live podcast interview is Amanda Tyler. She's the executive director of the Baptist Joint Committee. Amanda, thank you for joining the conversation. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Andy. All right, for those that for whatever reason are not familiar with Baptist Joint Committee, or you might hear me refer to it as the BJC, uh, tell us about the organization. So we are headquartered in Washington, D.C. That's where I am right now. And we have been, this is our 84th year as Baptist Joint Committee. Uh, And we are Baptist in our heritage, uh, though our mission is for everyone. We support faith, freedom for all. So we defend religious freedom uh, out of our Baptist heritage, our Baptist perspective, and our theology, uh, knowing that uh, the separation of church and state in our American context is the best way to protect religious freedom for all. Uh, So we are a legal um, advocacy and education organization. We do a lot of work. As I mentioned, we work here in Washington, so we do a lot of work with Congress and with the Supreme Court, filing briefs in the Supreme Court, amicus briefs. Uh, when church-state cases come to the court, uh, providing some counsel to Congress as well on issues of religious freedom and do a lot of education work out in the field, including in conversations uh, just like this one. Uh, We also try to equip our supporters with the information they need to be advocates in their communities and contexts. And if people would like to learn more about BJC, uh, you can go to our website, bjconline.org. Of course, we have a really strong partnership with uh, Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. It's one of 16 supporting bodies uh, supporting BJC's work, and we work in partnership uh, because this area of protecting religious freedom for all people is uh, a core uh, thing that we hold in common with CBF and are so grateful for that partnership. Well, I can imagine that y'all haven't had an active year. There hasn't been any controversy in Washington, D.C. or anything to advocate for, Um, you know, maybe to give our listeners a sneak peek into some of your work. What's been some of the major things that y'all have worked on this year? This has been, uh, you know, that unprecedented should just like go out of our vocabulary because that (laughs) word is used so much. But um, even before the pandemic hit, this was a really remarkable year in religious freedom. Um, You know, the Supreme Court had a blockbuster term last term and had, you know, five different cases that touched on religious freedom in some way. So we were really working to respond to those, of course. Anytime there's a presidential election, there are a lot of church state questions and questions of religious freedom that come up. So we were already anticipating that. And then, of course, the global pandemic hit. And then there were a lot of novel questions that came with pandemic, including around church state and religious freedom, uh, you know, areas of interest, Uh, you know, where thinking in particular about uh, closures or uh, stay-at-home orders and how that impacted houses of worship, um, you know, government aid in the form of uh, the Paycheck Paycheck Protection Program and and that aid that went to nonprofits, including houses of worship. So we were helping answer uh, questions in that area. And then, of course, our global reckoning with racism. And I think that that 
question coming up, we'll get into this quite a bit here when we talk about Christian nationalism, but how to understand how race and religious liberty overlap. That's been a major area of emphasis for us at BJC this year. Uh, and then, you know, we had, of course, uh, the death of a Supreme Court justice, Justice Ginsburg, and the nomination of another uh, you know, person to serve on the court and Judge Barrett. And so BJC provided some analysis of her record and her background um, in the confirmation hearings last week. Uh, there was also uh, two weeks ago, another church state case heard by the Supreme Court with another one coming up the day after the election. Um, so it has been an incredibly busy year um, for, for us here at BJC as we've been, I think, hoping to provide some context, some analysis, um, and opening up for conversations like this one about how we can best all support religious freedom for all in a really difficult and challenging time that we're facing as a country. Well, BJC will hold a special place in my heart in this pandemic because it was uh, honestly the last meeting, official meeting place I had in D.C. We were there for advocacy and action, and then all of a sudden everybody realized they needed to get home because this pandemic was uh, was happening all around us. Um, That's right. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, was, I, I, think, I think that was the last group that we had in our office space, you know, before, of course, we shut down as well for the um, for the pandemic. It was a crazy, crazy week, to say the least. Um, so the focus of our conversation today is Christian nationalism. And uh, for those that aren't familiar with this terminology, define it for us. Yeah, so Christian nationalism is a political ideology and cultural framework that tries to merge our identities as Americans and Christians. Um, so it suggests that to be a true American, that you have to be a Christian. Uh, Christian nationalism tends to rely pretty heavily on a mythical founding of the United States as a, quote, Christian nation. And, you know, I find I think it's always a good place to start with definitions so that we're speaking from the same page. You know, one could describe the United States as a Christian nation because a majority of Americans still identify as Christian um, in surveys about religious beliefs. And so in that way, I, I agree that the United States is a majority Christian nation. But often when that term is used, they're instead saying that the country was founded by Christians for Christians or to give Christians some kind of preferential standing in our country. It also suggests that the founding of the country was somehow providential, um, that God shows fa special favor for the United States above other countries. Um, and so in that way suggests that to be a good Christian, that you have to be American. Um, it is distinct from Christianity as a religion. It is really, it is connected no doubt. And I think um, part of what Christian nationalism has done has actually, in some ways, changed the character of Christianity in the United States. Um, but it is more about identity uh, than about religion. Uh, Christian nationalism shows up in a lot of different ways in our culture. I think some of the most extreme examples of Christian nationalism involve violence. Um, when you think about people who, for instance, um, the Tree of Life um, tragedy, the anniversary of that is coming up. Um, you know, when people go into a house of worship, um, such as a synagogue, and, and shoot people because they somehow don't belong in the United States. That is a very extreme, violent form of Christian nationalism. Uh, but I think it's important to point out how Christian nationalism shows up in our culture in much um, more mundane ways. Um, and in, in that way, it's it's very insidious, right? Because it's difficult to root out. It's in so many different aspects of our life. So in things like insisting that we put um, in God we trust, um, which is one of our national mottos, but insisting that we put that on as many things as possible, whether it be the wall of a public school or as the voters in uh, Mississippi are going to be considering very soon on their state flag, you know, that that is an example of Christian nationalism in our culture. A another example of Christian nationalism can also be found in our churches sometimes. Um, when you have an American flag on the altar of a church, that is an example of Christian nationalism. And so um, I think that it's helpful to point out some of these examples and how they exist and, and are are so pervasive throughout our society that we don't even often um, recognize them. 
And in that way, there are some parallels, I think, between Christian nationalism and racism um, when we think about how how race and the issue of racism is so pervasive in our society that shows up in a lot of ways. And so when I talk about Christian nationalism, I really like to talk about it as an ideology, as a cultural framework, and not label people as Christian nationalists. Because in some ways, you can't live in the United States and not be a Christian nationalist because that ideology is so pervasive in our midst. And, and there are, of course, you know, different gradations of that. But um, but I hope that gives a good opening framework for what Christian nationalism is. Yeah. Well, a, a Kevin Cruz's book, uh, which is a book I highly recommend for those that are interested in, in kind of understanding the more modern myth, uh, mythos around this, is uh, the name of the book is called One Nation Under God. And he lays out the history of the creation of the mythos of America as a Christian nation um, to the 1930s and the formation of this unholy alliance of religion and politics and money. And over the decades, um, you know, you see with the addition of one nation under God added to the Pledge of Allegiance, which wasn't, you know, even added until, you know, the last 70 years or so. And the creation of the National Prayer Breakfast and the prostituting of denominational leaders to political parties. So how can such a fresh concept overtake the mythos of American Christians? You know, how is how has this become such a, a common ideology among American Christians, if you will? Yeah. And I think I think that that's an excellent point uh, book that you that you mentioned there and, and one that I have have read as well. And, I, you know, I th I've also read other books about Christian nationalism and that even date it further back than that, that can really start to see Christian nationalism as a myth. Um, back to, you know, kind of the second generation after the founding. And, you know, so here we were, young country of Americans who were really looking to upsize our stature on the world stage. And what better way to do it than to say, well, God's hand had a hand in founding of our country. And so then you had George Washington made into a kind of a Moses figure. Um, you had kind of the use of the Bible to try to justify um, some of America's greatness. You saw it um, come out in some of the manifest destiny um, of, of the period as well and then in the next, the following generations. So just to give a, a little, and I'm not a historian, uh, though I have talked with historians as I've been researching and understanding Christian nationalism better. Um, but I think that some of that history helps explain it when it has been around for so long and, and intermingling with our practice of religion that it has changed our religion in some ways in the country that we need to be mindful of as we're thinking about our theology, as we're following Christ, how can we better understand and recognize Christian nationalism in a way that doesn't co-opt our faith into some kind of patriotic enterprise? And and I think that's another point about Christian nationalism is trying to separate it from nationalism, from patriotism. Mm -hmm. You know, patriotism is love of country. And, and I consider myself to be a patriot and patriotic in a lot of different ways and how I love the country. But for, for nationalism kind of requires almost a blind allegiance. And when you get into that level of nationalism and then you put it up against something else that requires quite a bit of our allegiance, our religion, those things can tend to compete, and it's often the religion that gets the short shrift there and that we can then move into an area of idolatry, an area where our, our faith can be really compromised by our following of Christian nationalism. So I think it's really incumbent upon Christians to understand how this works better in our, in our own minds, in our cultures, in our society, so that we can make sure that we're really practicing Christianity and not Christian nationalism. Yeah. Well, you know, you just hit on something there that you hear. Uh, it's a common cop out. I think typically spoken by people who don't realize they're such staunch Christian nationalists is that speaking about these matters is, quote, anti-American. You know, mm -hmm. so let's dive a little deeper there. What's, what's your response to such claims? Well, you know, of course, 
I, I've devoted my life to defending religious freedom. So I am, you know, I love the United States. I love the First Amendment. I also think that it's often an ideal that we haven't always reached, right? And so this idea of being able to criticize our country and our shortcomings, that that actually helps us lean and fulfill the promises of the Constitution in a way that I think that is ultimately more patriotic than, um, again, just saying that we can't have, we can't question our history as Americans to have a better understanding of it. I think, of course, we're having a lot of questions, a lot of conversations, necessary conversations, I think, right now about the nature of history, about where we need more truth telling. Um, and, and I think that that kind of approach to history, that kind of, that that is ultimately very patriotic. Um, and when I think about also being a Baptist and an American, those aren't the same things, right? That, that, But I think about both of my identities, that tradition of dissent, I think, is very highly prized. And this idea that you can dissent from the majority and still have a sense of love of country and want it, wanting it and, and love of religion, right? Wanting to fulfill the best of our ideals. Um, so, that, that's one answer I have there. I think another response, and I want to talk quite a bit about this here, is one effort that the BJC has helped lead, something called Christians Against Christian Nationalism. The way that we talk about patriotism and the Christians Against Christian Nationalism initiative is that patriotism does not require us to minimize our religious convictions. Um, this idea that sometimes our religion might actually call on us to speak truth to power in some way, to question um, some of what the state is doing as wrong. Um, that doesn't mean that we aren't patriotic, but if we have to uh, be blindly loyal to a country that we don't believe is fulfilling the best of who we are as a people, including what our causes of conscience are telling us, um, then that's asking us to choose our our nationalism over our religion. Hmm. Well, you know, I, I wonder, you know, kind of as we transition a little deeper into this concept, um, maybe, you know, point out for us some of the common um, uh, markers or examples of Christian nationalism um, in American history. Well, I mean, I think we've touched on some of them already and in, in kind of looking at um, some examples over the last hundred years, whether it be adopting in God we trust um, as a national motto or adding under God to the um, Pledge of Allegiance. Um, off, we also have examples of uh, religious national monuments in some ways or in public spaces. Um, other examples of ceremonial religion. And again, I, I we talk about a spectrum, right? So not all of these are to the nth degree of Christian nationalism, but I think just the pervasiveness of how this might send a message that to really belong here, to, to be a true American, that you must be Christian, that that is what points to that this is an example of Christian nationalism. Uh, there was a case recently at the Supreme Court, I think, that might provide an example. Um, it was the uh, American Legion uh, versus American Humanist Association case, and it, it had um, at, at the center of that case was a 40-foot cross at a major intersection um, in a community that's not that far from from here in Washington. And, and that cross was erected right after the end of World War I. Um, and it was erected as a monument to the uh, local uh, dead, the, the, so the young men, and I think just young men who had gone to serve um, in World War I and who had died. And so they, they erected this cross to commemorate them. Um, again, sending the signal that that the cross meant to be an American in this case. Uh, and then several decades later, they rededicated the cross to stand for all people who had died in war. Again, sending the signal, this, this very specific religious symbol that that somehow stood for all Americans. Um, and then this case went to the Supreme Court and, and at heart, you know, it, in that 
case, an argument came out um, that, no, the cross wasn't actually a religious symbol. This was the government's argument in this case. The cross isn't a religious symbol. It's just a generic symbol of honoring dead. And of course, for, for us as Christians, that's deeply offensive. The cross is indeed a religious symbol and one that's very important to us as Christians. That's also offensive to those Americans who aren't Christian for whom this symbol supposedly is supposed to stand for. They also recognize that as a religious symbol um, and one that doesn't speak to them. Uh, and so I think that that's an example. It's a it's a 40 foot example of Christian nationalism um, that is a historical relic. And the fact that that's, you know, a hundred year old cross at this point, um, but one that was allowed to stand. Um, and the, the court did say in its opinion, you know, limited it really to the facts of that case and, and send a signal that such new monuments might not be upheld in that way. But I think that it is up to to us, to those of us who are understanding in Christian nationalism now, to understand what is wrong with that, right? That that, that is both a threat to religious minorities who are who are sent a signal of not belonging here if they're not Christian, that their country is somehow um, Christian in nature, even though that's not what our founding documents say at all. Um, but it's also a problem for those of us who are Christians if the state is to appropriate our core religious symbols and then claim them for their own um, in ways that are at odds with our faith. Hmm. We're going to pause here uh, to tell you about uh, our other annual sponsor, which is Fuller Seminary. Fuller Seminary's MA in Theology and Ministry offers a practice-focused theological education. Learn from Fuller's seasoned scholar practitioners with online classes and apply what you're learning in your own context. Whatever your ministry goals, Fuller Seminary's MA in Theology and Ministry will help you take the next step in your vocation. For more information, visit fuller.edu backslash MATM degree. That's fuller.edu backslash M-A-T-M degree. Uh, you know, over the weekend, uh, the president campaigned at the International Church of Las Vegas in Nevada. And I know that um, you can't imagine a church in America putting on a worship service for a president, let alone the fact that the worship included the waving of American flags while singing Make Me a Vessel. Um, tell us how we ought to interpret such a worship experience. Well, uh, it, when I think about an example, I, I th the question that comes to mind, well, who or what are you worshiping? You know, when, when you replace um, symbols of our, 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 our political system and the American flag, and with, you know, if you, if you put that here, we're just talking about other symbols of our faith, but the cross, um, if you have a political leader who's leading a rally in a, in a place of worship, um, I, the question that comes to mind is who exactly are you worshiping? What what is at play here? Um, not to mention, I think, some of the other legal questions that come into play in areas like this when it might look like an organization that has a 501c3 tax status, this, you know, uh, might be using some of their resources um, to endorse or support a particular candidate for office. That's a, that's a whole nother conversation. But from a from a perspective of what that does to the church. Um, I think that that's a real problem of idolatry in many ways it, and confusing of, of religious leadership and political leadership in ways that are ultimately most harmful to the church itself. Um, so that's my shorthand analysis of that particular um, example. And of course, it's not the first time that we see it. And it's not unique to one party either, I will say, yeah. you know, um, so it, it it's, it's a concern. I think anytime that a house of worship joins so closely with a particular political party or a candidate um, that that really harms its independence, um, which is really important for religious freedom in this country, is to keep the institutions of religion and government separate. That's something that helps support religious freedom. Um, but it also works to threaten the prophetic voice and witness of the church, this ability to speak truth to power which is core to so many religious traditions, is really hampered 
um, when one is used and co-opted uh, by those in power. Hmm. Well, I, I think some there's three primary theological challenges that I have to that. Uh, one is, you know, prostituting yourself at, at the um, altar of, of politics. I think the second thing is idolatry, which you've raised earlier. And the third issue, I would say, is uh, this concept of dualism. You know, um, you know, is the church not God's um, ordained body within the world? You know, living out the fruition of, of the kingdom of God, seeing the kingdom of God come here on earth, uh, and if it's not the church, then, you know, you're substituting the church for country. Um, you know, so certainly, you know, for those that are thinking about Christian national nationalism, they might just see it as an unfortunate form of idolatry, but they don't maybe see it as having any real bearing on the end game of politics and policy. Um, so in your experience, how, how does Christian nationalism affect politics and policy? Yeah, and this I really have to rely quite a bit on a couple of sociologists of religion who have written a wonderful book. Uh, Andrew Whitehead and Sam Perry have written Taking America Back for God, Christian Nationalism in the United States. And their book is based on a number of academic studies that they did beforehand that really studied Christian nationalism, tried to um, kind of single that out from religious identity and how that might play into how people vote, how people think about certain issues. And the results are really quite astounding. So first, kind of how they test for Christian nationalism. Their surveys asking a number of questions, things, and they found that Americans who embrace Christian nationalism strongly agree with statements like the federal government should declare the United States to be a Christian nation that success of the United States is part of God's plan, that the federal government should advocate Christian values. So that's how from, you know, a, a, a social science perspective, they can kind of assess how where someone might be on this Christian nationalism scale. But then they find that um, Americans who embrace Christian nationalism are more likely to, and I'm going to lead a whole read a whole list of things and just show you just how pervasive this is in policy and politics. They're more likely to approve of authoritarian tactics like demanding people show respect for national symbols and traditions, fear and distrust religious minorities, including Muslims, atheists, and Jewish people, condone police violence toward Black Americans and distrust accounts of racial inequality in the criminal justice system, believe racial inequality is due to the personal shortcomings of minority groups, report being very uncomfortable with both interracial marriage and transracial adoption, hold anti-immigrant views, fear refugees, oppose science, scientists and science education in schools, and believe that men are better suited for all leadership roles while women are better suited to care for children in the home. So this, this just shows you how widespread, what kind of widespread impact Christian nationalism has on our politics and our policies. And, and their, their studies have shown that you can control for religious observance in different ways. And, it, and whether someone scores highly on this Christian nationalism scale is more likely to tell you how they come down on these issues than even their, um, their religion or their church attendance. Mm -hmm. You wrote recently, Christian nationalism threatens religious freedom for all. It asks the government to show preference for Christianity over other religions or religion over non-religion. Many people who think in the framework of a Christian nation would make the argument that Christianity is the truth. So why not make it the religion of the nation? From the opposing perspective, um, why do you think religious freedom for all is the true Christian stance on policy? Well, from a theological standpoint, you know, thinking about God as a God of freedom and giving humans the ability to choose to, to follow God or not to follow God goes back to the Genesis story, you know, that God created us as free beings and that 
we could say yes to God or no to God and have all the consequences that go with that. And so in order to support true religious freedom, including our, our freedom to say yes to God, uh, requires that the government stay out of that decision as much as possible. Um, from an experiential perspective, you know, pr position. We as Baptists were a persecuted minority, you know, from our beginnings in England and then in the early days of the American colonies when there were established religions in a lot of the colonies. And so it was Baptists who were calling for the disestablishment of religion, who didn't want the government um, preferring uh, one religion over another. And it was those Baptist dissenters, those early lobbyists and advocates that helped get um, freedom of religion into the U.S. Constitution and into the First Amendment. And, you know, when people advocate and say, well, you know, they meant to have a Christian nation in some way, that's that's what they wanted. They came here, you know, they kind of take some of sometimes people who are talking about this from a Christian nationalist perspective will take um, our founding as, as for religious freedom, but say that they wanted to have religious freedom for Christians here. And I say, well, they have a really funny way of doing that because in our founding document, Article 6, the only place that religion or, or religious is mentioned in the, act, in the original constitution is Article 6, where it prevents prohibits any kind of religious test for public office. And I say that's a really funny way to set up a Christian nation is to say we're not going to have a religious test for public office. Um, and then, of course, they come back in the Bill of Rights four years later and say Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This is their way of setting up a system of separation of church and state that the government will not promote religion or prohibit or, or prevent you from practicing your religion unless it has a really important, compelling reason to do so. And so that that is the way that we have protected religious freedom for all, not in a way that's hostile to religion, in a way that understands that religion requires a freedom from government control and authority um, and that religion in the hands of government often works to, to pervert it in ways that can sometimes go beyond our recognition. See, I think whether folks want to admit it or not, Christian nationalism, uh, due to its zealous belief in American authority, has, as, quote, sanctioned by God, have backed violence and intimidation, authoritarian tactics, why do you think Christian nationalists so willingly disconnect Jesus' teachings on violence and love from their allegiance to such aggression? I mean, I think it gets down to the question of this confusion of authority or, or to whom you're actually paying your allegiance. You know, when you were talking about dualism earlier, I, I what came to mind for me was Jesus' teaching about you know, rendering unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. This idea, this recognition of our dual citizenship, that we are living in two kingdoms at once and we have to figure out what to render to which. And so this idea of violence and authority, I think of as people mixing up their their allegiances in ways. You know, when the when a government is calling on some kind of um some kind of violence, even even in some ways we think justified violence or just war theory, but it does kind of ask us to 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 pick and choose between who we're going to follow here and those who have a very strong bent towards Christian nationalism. Sorry, those who have a strong bent towards Christian nationalism are more likely to um, to to forget about the teachings of Jesus and and follow what they're hearing from their political authorities. That's my take. I don't know if what if what your your thoughts on that particular issue are. Well, I just love that you were so passionate about it. You're just like, well, I'm gonna punch the microphone and, <laughs> and emphasize what I'm trying to say. Listen to me, people. Uh, <laughs> friends of uh, the uh, CBF podcast, Robert P. Jones, recently said in an interview uh, with him that you are statistically more likely to find candidates for white supremacy at a church on Sunday morning than a coffee shop across town. So let's talk about the um, the equivalence of white supremacy with Christian nationalism, which is uh, 
where a lot of people start to tread into the uncomfortable nature of, of this conversation. Um, in reality, why can't you separate Christian nationalism from white supremacy? Yeah, um, that's a that's a question that I get a lot. You know, a lot of times when people talk about Christian nationalism, they're like, well, isn't that just white Christian nationalism? Um, and I think the way that we've talked about it is that Christian nationalism often overlaps with and provides cover for white supremacy and racial subjugation. So I don't think that you can fully understand white supremacy just by thinking about Christian nationalism. I think that some of those issues um, are, are distinct and, and different, but there is a lot of overlap between them. Um, and I think in part, I mean, I, and I, there, there's so much that we can talk about on this topic, but I think when we were talking about history and about relying so heavily on this this mythical founding of the United States as a Christian nation. I mean, what is implicit in that is the founding of the country as a white Christian nation. They are, you know, leaving out the entire history of slavery in that. And this idea, you know, if if we think about the founding as somehow providential or that this was this was God's will, you know, it's very problematic to say the least, to think that it is God. It was God's will to set up a country on the foundation of slavery, um, and so I think we, when we we have this mythical idea, or we idealize the history of the United States in this way, in this very, in this way that had you know white men in power, white landowning men in power, disenfranchising, and in some ways, of course, enslaving huge parts of our population, that there is a lot of racism and white supremacy inherent in that conversation and that idealization of a, of a Christian nation. Yeah, of course, you know, the whole concept of, of manifest destiny, um, you know, that, that God has ordained the progress of essentially uh, white people to advance the cause of you know, capitalism, uh, imperialism, and, and so on and so forth. You know, what are, so people can kind of understand a little bit better, um, what are some of the ways that you see Christian nationalism and white supremacy as unfortunate bedfellows? Yeah, and I, I think that Robert P. Jones' most recent book is, an ex is a wonderful example of how um, when religion is co-opted by the state in some ways, it can really be mangled and changed in order to justify unjust actions of the state. You know, and, and in his book, he talks a lot about the history of American Christianity, um, not just in the South, really, all over the country in ways that the theology was twisted to support slavery and then to continue to support um, Jim Crow segregation for, and, and then even now to the present day in some places to support pl police brutality um, and, and killings by the police. And so this idea, I think the state knows the power of cloaking things in religious arguments, right? And so the state is going to have a rationale to try to get religion and religious people on its side. And when when religious people allow themselves to be used in such a way, in ways that can be so unjust, then they allow their religion to be co-opted and um, changed in, in the process. And I think the examples of how religion has been used to perpetuate racism in this country are incredibly stark and really important for people to understand. Um, and so, to get an example, I'm just thinking about Mississippi. I already invoked the the vote on the flag. Of course, you know, the the people of Mississippi are going to have a, a chance to vote to remove the Confederate battle flag from their state flag, which I think is a wonderful thing that should have happened many years ago. Um, but in doing so, they're voting on another flag that will put in God we trust on the flag that requires that the new symbol have, in, that was actually the law passed by the legislature there, that it had to have in God we trust. And I think kind of asking about what is that about when in so many people's minds, having this idea of a Christian nation takes them back to this idea of the founding of the country as a white Christian nation. It perpetuates racism in more subtle ways, but in ways that in some ways can be just as dangerous if they go unquestioned. 
um, because it allows the racism to continue in ways that are not quite as obvious, perhaps, as uh, the Confederate battle flag and your state flag. I'm, I'm smiling, you know, unfortunately, just thinking about, you know, my neighbors to the east that, you know, I guess in their mind, they're thinking, well, we've taken down the Confederate aspect of our flag and we're swapping it for something better, um, you know, but in part, it might not be something better. Um, I think, you know, the, the conversation about white supremacy and Christian nationalism, it's so difficult because it taps into um, white elitism. And I think that's the hardest part for a lot of people within the white community um, who've really had to come to terms or just completely ignore everything that has happened since May um, and, and, and highlighting and bolstering uh, the disparity within our country that, uh, you know, to come to terms with Christian nationalism is to come to terms with one's own elitism and privilege. And um, I don't know if you've met many people of privilege, but they're not really willing to give that up, you know? And so this is a, a core value, a core uh, pillar, if you will, of Christian nationalism um, that we don't want to come to terms with because uh, we've developed so much of our society, so much of the um, systemic issues of, of racism around uh, white supremacy, a white elitism, if you will. Um, so that's why I think this is this is the most dodgy and most difficult part of this conversation for a lot of people. I think it is. I think it starts to hit very close to home. And, you know, bringing up the word privilege, you know, I, I think a lot of what we see, and this gets back to the core work of BJC, of uh, understanding and promoting uh, a full religious freedom for all people. We, we hear those words religious freedom sometimes invoked when they're really talking about uh, a sense of loss of religious privilege. Right. And um, and that feeds right into that idea of Christian nationalism, that in some way that Christianity should be privileged. And if it's not privileged, then somehow religious freedom is being violated when it is quite the opposite. When Christianity is being privileged, religious freedom is actually in jeopardy um, because it is not full freedom for everyone, including those who don't claim a religious tradition. So we're certainly talking about religious minorities in the country, um, but we're also talking about a growing at, you know, segment of our population that doesn't choose to affiliate with any religion at all. Um, I, it, we're we're here, we're just a couple of weeks away now from election day and this election season. And one thing that has struck me um, as we, you know, there are attacks sometimes on uh, Vice President Biden's faith. Um, this idea that, you know, I, you know, that somehow I, I've heard these claims made by President Trump that that if he's elected, that Christianity is going to suffer in some way. And those who rush to the defense of President of Vice President Biden say, oh, no, no, he's a Christian. He's a lifelong Catholic. And while that is true, that bothers me because it perpetuates this idea that to be the U.S. president, that you have to be a Christian and that not to be a Christian is in some way going to threaten Christianity in, in this way. And that goes back to our earlier conversation about Article 6 and that there would be no religious test for presidency. And so every time I hear that kind of back and forth, I cringe because I'm thinking about this is a religious test that we are imposing as a people in ways that really threaten the idea and the freedom and being accepting of all Americans, regardless of their faith tradition. Yeah, that's that's come in so many different forms in American history, too. I mean, you think back to uh, the fight between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, kind of that period of time in the presidency where there was this fear that, um, you know, that the Catholics would take over kind of American politics and the papacy would, would rule over America. And it's just always found some sort of nuanced form to drive fear. Uh, and it typically comes from the conservative right, not to isolate our, our brethren from that side, but they tend to be the ones that are working out of a scarcity, uh, working out of fear and loss of, of control. Um, let's bring us uh, kind of as we kind of draw our conversation to, to a close is uh, a lot of folks watching this, um, listening to the podcast later on might be thinking, well, what can I do about all this uh, as an individual? Um, what can my local church do? 
Yeah. So, I mean, that was a question that we at BJC started to ask ourselves more and more because we were seeing as Christian nationalism has been around for decades, centuries, but we were really seeing rising incidents of it. And so we helped lead and put together an initiative called Christians Against Christian Nationalism. Um, not subtle in its in its labeling, and but very clear because we wanted to take a strong stand against Christian nationalism. But if you go to this website, christiansagainstchristiannationalism.org, you'll see a core statement of principles that are what we're for. And these principles are really just a restatement of those common, those core principles of religious freedom for all, that people of all faiths and none have the right and responsibility to engage constructively in the public square, that government should not prefer one religion over another or govern or religion over non-religion. These, these core ideas that have for so many years united us as Americans and can unite us as Christians who come at these issues from a number of different, you know, perspectives and understandings and might vote differently, but we can, we can agree on these common principles. So I would encourage, um, you know, those watching to go to Christians Against Christian Nationalism.org. Anyone who self-identifies as a Christian is welcome to sign our statement to go on record to then share it with others. But also we've collected a number of helpful resources on this website that we hope can help you understand Christian nationalism better, can help spot it, and to help have conversations with people in our churches, in our broader communities, in with those people, you know, as as we said, Andy, those and people like us who who enjoy quite a bit of Christian privilege in this country, um, to to have those tough conversations and to really understand this, so that we can start to dismantle some of these really harmful um, assumptions. I think that really threaten our unity as Americans, but also our faith as Christians and. On that website, we also, last year on the BJC podcast, I did a 10-part podcast series on Christian nationalism. And on the website, we have a, a listeners and readers guide, a discussion guide that goes with that 10-part podcast series. So that would be another thing I would recommend for churches maybe um, in this time of social distancing to, you know, form a little Zoom reading discussion group, you know, to listen to the podcast and to talk about some of these things, to share it with your neighbors um, and to start to have some of these, you know, difficult conversations, but conversations that I think are are really necessary if we're going to understand how this ideology is at work in ways that sometimes we don't even recognize. Hmm. We got one question from uh, a listener that uh, we haven't touched on some of these. We've touched on some of these other ones, but this one we we certainly haven't. Um, the question is, what role has Christian nationalism played in the decline of Christianity in America? Uh, I think that's an I think that's an excellent question, and I think, um, I, I mean, that's a complicated question about like. You know what is the decline of of Christianity? I, I'm going to assume it might be church attendance or the ways. I, I'm going to I'm going to take that assumption for the question. I think we could think about it in other ways, but I do think that um, in all these ways that kind of harm our Christian witness or or harm you know how people view our values um, as Christians, that it can that being too closely associated with the state in some of these difficult ways can really harm how we're viewed by others and whether people really want to associate with us and, and our integrity as a religion. Um, I, I will give one example. I think that a lot of people, including myself, I was really horrified by what um, back in the early days of the protests for racial justice, when um, there were peaceful protesters in Lafayette Square, that area that's now been renamed Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington, D.C., um, and they were you know, violently cleared from the space so that President Trump could go across the street and stand in front of a sign for St. John's Church and hold up a Bible, right? And and not say anything, but just to have this photo op of a Bible in front of a church after clearing a, a square of peaceful protests. I think that for someone from the outside, maybe someone, and maybe some people who were also 
you know, I had a particular reaction to that as a Christian, but for those on the outside, if that's what Christianity is, do I really want to be associated with that? If that's clearing peaceful protesters um, from a place to protesting racial justice. So I think that that's an example of when this religion is used by the state in ways um, to prop up political power that that can repel people from your cause and your in your church. Well, I certainly think it's a an outreach strategy for a congregation to um, to make sure that people don't, you know, that pe- make sure people understand that our church doesn't align itself with this type of, of thing. Um, you know, Pew Research has done extraordinary uh, studies into why so many people uh, are turned off by the church, why people are leaving the church, why people aren't engaging the church in their community. And, you know, the number one reason has nothing to do with preaching, has to do with worship style, has come down to the church's authentic witness within the community that they serve. You know, that Christians are viewed as being um, anti-immigrant, anti-LGBTQ, supporting racism, if you will. And so what a wonderful opportunity for churches to clarify their identity within the community um, by speaking out against these things, by by talking about the, I would say, the full inclusion of the gospel, um, that we see Jesus uh, standing against such injustices more likely than, uh, within the Bible than we see him speaking some of the words that have become so uh, commonplace within evangelicalism. Um, so, yeah. I think that's right. I think there's tremendous opportunity, you know, and, and to understand and admit, you know, how Christian nationalism might be at play in our own communities in ways, again, that we haven't really fully interrogated, um, but to be, you know, intentional about looking at that and, as you said, kind of distancing ourselves from that and say, you know, we, we are here about Christianity, not Christian nationalism. Um, and to, to be very clear about that might very well be attractive to those who have been repelled from a different kind of Christianity they've seen in our culture. Hmm. Well, just a moment uh, before we wrap up, we're going to tell everyone about some brilliant resources that help you take a stand against Christian nationalism. But first, we want to let you know about our podcast listener support project. Since 2016, CBF has brought you over 150 episodes with authors and practitioners for conversations that matter. These stories of creativity and innovation have garnered weekly support from around the United States and the world. And we're inviting you, the listener, to join in connecting with the podcast. You can become a monthly listener supporter and receive some perks like name recognition on the podcast, questions for upcoming guests, free books from the podcast, joining the podcast for an interview, and a VIP experience at Next Summer's General Assembly. There's five levels of support starting at $5 a month. For more information, you can join the community of listeners uh, by visiting cbf.net backslash podcast support. If you want to learn more about this movement that Amanda was talking about, you can visit christiansagainstchristiannationalism.org, where you can find a treasure trove of resources and history lessons, petitions, and action steps. Uh, I want to extend a word of thank you to those that are watching this and your great questions to our conversation. And of course, Amanda, thank you for uh, the Baptist Joint Committee's partnership with CBF, as well as your critical leadership in the cause of religious liberty for all people. Oh, thank you, Andy. It's been great to talk with you, and I hope this inspires many more conversations on this topic. 